everyone. Welcome back to Build. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper. Nosferatu 2 is AMC's new supernatural horror series based on Joe Hill's best-selling novel of the same name. Actress Ashley Cummings plays Vic McQueen, a gifted woman with a supernatural ability to find lost things, an ability that puts her on a collision course with the evil and immortal Charlie Manx. Take a look. I dreamt there was a man. He's involved in something. Daniel! Something bad. Why'd you marry me? You clearly think I'm a moron. Chris, I think you're up to the wrong. I can't stand being under this roof with you. I saw a bridge in the middle of the woods that was demolished years ago. Where are you going? Honestly, I'm wrong. Vic McQueen? I need to take children to live an eternity in Christmas land. I'll do anything, Mr. Manx. The girl who finds lost things can find lost children. Don't you see you've been chosen? The McQueen might threaten Christmas land, but no one has ever been able to enter except me. I'm the only one with the power to stop him. And then I'm gonna burn Christmas land to the ground. What's happening to me? She can't be far. Bad people ought to be punished. There's a nice list and a naughty list. And she's not on my naughty list. Please help me welcome Ashley Cummings. Thank you. So good to meet you and sit down with you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Glad that you could be here. Um, I got to check out the first two episodes of Nosferatu, mm -hmm. and it is such a ride. And there's, I can. A literal ride. It's a literal ride, yep. yeah. I didn't know much about the, the book before the series. So I want to know for you, um, I know this is based on a book. Did you read that before you? accepted this project no I hadn't I I actually didn't know of Joe Hill's work uh prior to the audition and kind of quickly very quickly became a fan I think he's such a genius he's got such an intellect and and a wit and um he explores such interesting and meaningful topics through such an accessible lens and yeah his insight into psychology is is what really drew me to the story, I think, as well. And I think that's what will draw people to the show, is that there's obviously this uh, supernatural storyline that's really important, very prevalent, but it is also rooted in these in family conflict yeah. and these emotions and feelings that I think are really universal and relatable. So is that something that drew you to the script, is how kind of grounded it was in that like human connection? Absolutely. I think, you know, people often will talk about it being like a horror project and so on, and, and it didn't feel like it to me when we were making the show, you know, I kept kind of forgetting it was a uh, a horror show because I, I had a lot to do with the family drama, but it was also deeply rooted in this emotional journey that this girl goes on. And uh, for me, you know, Charlie Manx is a symbol of misogyny and patriarchy and, and, and these kinds of really deep issues that are very real and very prevalent in the world. So, um, so yeah, all of the, the journeys that she goes on in the supernatural realm inform her choices in the real life realm with her father and her family and vice versa. Yeah, it's funny. It's interesting you say he represents those things. I, and I, I was feeling that. And mm. also, I think people will watch and feel and connect to different things and interpret it yeah. their own way, for sure. Like, I don't think it's as clear cut. It's like sometimes you don't, right. you know, something seems wrong, but then you're like, oh, but maybe it's right. And Correct. That I mean, you nailed it. I mean, that's, that's the genius of both Joe Hill's writing and Jamie's adaptation is that, um, you know, it is so multi-layered. And everyone I speak to... Um, says the story is about something else. So it's like it's about parenthood or it's about psychology or it's about trauma. And, um, and yeah, one of the interesting, one of my favorite lines of the, the script, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but my mom says to me in one of the, an episode coming up is that people are not just good and not just bad. They, they, you know, they can be both essentially. And, and we do dive into that, you know, it's, um, it's it's trauma and it manifests itself and festers in certain ways and we have villains that kind of erupt from it but um, at the root of that if we really look deeper there's there's something beneath it so and there's the villains that look like villains and then there could be villains in your own life that maybe you don't 
see right. actually for who they are, which yeah. is something that I found really interesting about this show. Yeah, definitely. Um, the title, Nosferatu. Yes. Can, yeah. Can you explain that to me at all, what that means? Yeah. So um, Nosferatu is the German word for vampire. It was an old film um, initially back in the day. Um, and so Joe Hill, I mean, it's, it's kind of part of the entire the, – the world, you know, Charles Manx has um, he has an incredible kind of uh, the way he speaks and everything. He he loves playing with um, his you know his victims and so on. And it's it's a word game. It's a puzzle in and of itself. And and that's kind of inherent within the stories. And and it will uh, manifest itself further on, hopefully in season two and so on. Um, when Vic gets older, we don't we only cover a, the first third of the book in this season. So in season two, that will hopefully become a greater part of the story. But basically it's Charlie Manx's vanity license plate for this car that he kidnaps children in. Um, the car is is kind of a part of him. It um, is his vehicle, his um, knife is what we call it. So it's his vehicle to take him from the real world into his imagination. And let's talk about Vic. Um, I want to know... How is she compared to her in the book? Mm -hmm. Did you guys kind of stick to that or does she kind of have a whole new life in, in the show? Right. It was something we discussed quite heavily because Vic in in the show, 18-year-old Vic in the show is actually fairly different to the 18-year-old Vic in the novel. Um, you know, by the time we see 18-year-old Vic in the novel, she's kind of hardened. She has, you know, ice in her veins. Um, she's, you know, punching people and so on. We couldn't go there at the beginning of this series because we needed to create an emotional arc, but we didn't want to start off with an eight-year-old Vic and change... Well, Jamie didn't want to change actresses uh, throughout the show just so that we could kind of remain emotionally connected, I guess, to one actor, luckily for me, and my paycheck. Um, <laughs> but no, it was just, it was a privilege to kind of get to play um, the, the full arc of the character, at least in season one, and hopefully uh, more so than that. So yeah, we started off with a more innocent um, and, and perhaps naive girl and then a little bit of denial, and we will eventually take her to the, the darkness. What has what has your journey like been with Vic of just pulling back the, the layers and discovering who she is and, and deciding how to play certain scenes? Gosh, it's been um, it's been complex and fascinating. I Zach got he read all of the scripts before we started. I it was a conscious decision on Jamie the showrunner writer and Kari the director's part to withhold the scripts from me. So they wanted me to stay present with the story as it unfolded. Um, so they just wanted me to trust my instinct with it and not kind of get too heady about it and too intellectual and analytical, which I, I can do sometimes. So it was, it was really interesting just to, uh, but also to construct a hero and kind of, um, reimagine how that kind of comes about she's she's reluctant of course at first um she's an outsider she has a creative immensity and an emotional intensity that she doesn't know where to channel um and so these are these are aspects of her that are kind of typically associated with the feminine you know her empathy and her intuition and um and then she has this kind of tomboy-esque uh, shield that she kind of uses to protect herself uh, from the, from the world around her. You know, she she's growing up in an environment that's not so conducive to these qualities that she has, and so that was really in interesting to kind of realize that her heroism actually comes from these typically feminine qualities, and she's. Um, you know, her courage is that she's not fearless and she doesn't have this kind of unwavering emotional fortitude. What made her so heroic was that she was terrified and she showed up anyway. So that was a big part of the conversation, you know, just not making her a hero straight up. She kind of has to, she's flawed and she works her way into this courage. What's interesting about this show, and you, and you just uh, explained it perfectly, is that this is a girl who's very normal and grounded. And we haven't even talked about her supernatural right. powers. Yeah. You're talking about all of her personal powers, her vulnerability being mm -hmm. something that really kind of sets yeah. her apart. But on top of that, she also now has the ability to find lost things. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to viewers about what that means for her? 
so um, I don't know what a spoil is, but on uh, well, I'm having you <laughs> yeah, do it because I was like, I don't quite know how to. Well, bring I'm up. gonna get in trouble yeah. instead of you. Um, so basically, uh, early on, Vic discovers that her vehicle to accessing her imaginative world is her motorbike right here, um, and it allows her to find lost things. And she is set on this collision course with Manx in order to find the lost children that he takes to revitalize his soul. So it's kind of, it's a literal journey in order to find these lost children, but it's also a metaphorical one in terms of finding herself through this process and discovering the truth and, and facing the truth about her familial and environmental realities um, that she'd rather not look at. Yeah. So it's it's a journey both literally and metaphorically, and I love that about this work, is that it's not, you know, it's a, it's it has this genre element, but it's all in service of a truly emotional and and deeply grounded journey. Like it it was such a moving experience for me to be a part of and I learned so much personally and grew a lot as well. Yeah, and that's absolutely true because even though Minx is a villain, yeah. he has the ability to rationalize what he's doing. Right. And it is sort of connected to her own childhood and journey as well. Yeah. And so there's that extra layer of emotional conflict totally. because he thinks he's doing the right thing even though we view him as yeah. a villain. Yeah, and that's one of my favorite books in the in the novel which I, I constantly paraphrase and I need to like write it down and memorize it. Um, but Joe he'll say something about, you know, uh, villains always think they're doing the right thing. I, I guess that's what makes an, in an incredible villain. They always think they're doing the right thing. And and that's the tricky aspect of it, you know. Like, it's always, it's really important to, like, accountability is vital. Anger is important. But it's also really, it's, I feel that it's important to look at the entire picture to understand, again, that, this is a man who comes from trauma. Um, there's a graphic novel, The Wraith, which really explains Charles Manx's backstory. And um, to see how children, which is a huge part of our story, if they're not nurtured, um, you know, the, these manifestations can come out in kind of terribly negative ways. So it's important to, yeah, take a step back and kind of look at how to address the larger picture at hand rather than just assigning blame as important as you know accountability is is and it absolutely is but just to to really ch make change and impact change is kind of important to have n not necessarily empathy but like an understanding yeah sure. and part of uh, his journey in these two worlds is a physical transformation as yeah. well. And Zachary Kinto really, I, he was unrecognizable. Right, I know a lot of beginning. people were like, is he even in that trailer? Yeah. <laughs> so what was it like being on set with him? Cause you really, I mean, the makeup is really transformative. Mm. He, he doesn't look like himself at all. Right. Was he still on set doing normal things though in that get up? Yeah, it was hilarious. Like sometimes he would drive me, we'd be on, we'd get ready at like unit base and then drive, you know, half an hour to a different set. And he'd like, I'll, I'll take you for a ride. Cause he, he loves driving. and. I don't, um, but he'd be in, you know, his Audi with his like Adidas tracksuit on and his AirPods with his like 135 year old makeup. <laughs> and it was so confusing and a toothpick. And I was very uh, baffled. And sometimes he'd have like his contact lenses in. I'm like, can you even see out of those while you're driving? I feel like this is not safe. <laughs> but no, he's, um, it was helpful because he's such a lovely guy and to hate him that much was challenging. Yeah. Um, so the, the makeup helped me to separate Zach from from Charlie. Yeah, the 135-year-old makeup with uh, AirPods. Yeah. I w is there like it an Instagram photo of that somewhere? I would love to see I that. have something tucked away. Yeah, you should share With that. his dog, Skunk. <laughs> <laughs> so creepy. Um, so I love seeing you in this, but I know that you're Australian. Yeah. So I wanted, and you've done a lot of different projects in Australia and New Zealand. Yeah, so yeah. I want to know what that jump has been like doing some American TV and film. Gosh, I mean, the scale here is much larger. Um, we're in Australia and New Zealand, it's it's quite intimate. You know, we all we all know each other. Um, you know, it's it's like a little family. Everyone works together. So, I mean, coming onto this set, we you know 500 plus crew and trying to remember everyone's names was um was new to me but um craft services is a big thing I don't know if you know about this but it is like a, a table filled of filled with everything you could ever hope for like yeah. candy and and cake and it's it's there constantly like I had so many sugar crashes <laughs> throughout this show I had to really learn how to monitor the craft service I didn't successfully do it but um in Australia we have a tea trolley 
So you have like some tea and some nuts and some bickies. Um, is what What's bis- a bickies? It's a biscuit, which is not a, what you call biscuit. It's actually a cookie. Oh, okay. Yeah, so tea and bickies. It's kind of different from the craft service table. Um, <laughs> so th- yeah, that was, a, that was a major aspect, which probably wasn't that important to anyone else, but it was to me. Um, no, food is, is a vital. priority. <laughs> yeah. What you and said, like I was like, yeah, noted. five desserts, which I tried every day. I tried one of everything. Everyone was like, what? <laughs> it's not how it works. So yeah, I need to learn how to pace myself on the sugar front. You need the sugar though. It's a really physically demanding role. Sort of. But a, I do you up- ride the motorbike? No. Okay. I'm gonna, gonna be honest. I wasn't even allowed to turn it on for insurance purposes. I wish I hadn't told anyone that because Kelsey Abbott, my stunt double, makes me look really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I do the crying. She does the actual badass stuff. Right, right. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, she's incredible. But, yeah, no, they wouldn't even let me turn it on. That's okay. But I have heard that you've had to do this in previous roles. You've had to have training on motorbikes. Yeah. So you could do it if you need yeah, to. Yeah, I could do it. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> No, I um I did learn I did get my motorcycle license before my car license when I was like 16 or something for a role. Uh but I haven't really touched it since then just because whenever you do a job you sign something saying I'm not going to skateboard, I'm not going to surf, I'm not going to jump off any planes and I'm not going to ride my motorbike. Um to you know insurance uh so I haven't been able to since then but my dad is a big he rides motorbikes he always has I grew up you know never being able to sleep at night and so he would watch the bike races and I would sleep behind him on the couch so it's always been you know a part of my life we traveled around going to bike races in Italy and so on the Formula One and in cars and stuff like that so um it was really amazing he had the exact same model of bike that Vic has in the book. So the triumph that will hopefully happen in season two, my dad had when he was young and he had a big head of hair like this that he would like put his helmet on and all his hair would like stick out the side. So I felt really close to dad throughout the filming process. That's such a cool connection. Yeah, it was so beautiful. And he gave me a lot of insight into the psychology around it, you know, like it's quite meditative for him as well, so... You, in, uh, you mentioned traveling around a lot, and I know that you we were born in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah. Which is so cool, but your family seemed to be kind of this spontaneous family that liked to explore a little bit. Yeah. So how did that influence you and in deciding to get into acting? Well, um, much to their horror, they instilled an independence and a keen curiosity for the world, and I left them when I was 14. <laughs> They were like, what? It's not what we intended. Um, so I came I came to America um, then and started traveling around. And that's when I kind of took off and, um, and discovered acting because I met some actors out here. So that was, that was definitely how it influenced acting quite literally. But also I think it just, their attitude to the world and understanding people and cultures and their empathy and curiosity is something that I've utilized completely with my work and the ability to adapt to new environments was a part of my childhood so um yeah it was it was really integral to the the work that I do today 14 years old so then what was that journey like auditioning and did you take class how did you sort of get to where you are now so I returned to Australia and enrolled in a diploma of film. Um, so I learned, you know, the filmmaking process. Um, it was over a year and we made a feature film and um, and I acted in that. And uh, so, and I had done one other film, but as a dancer, I was a dancer before all this. And um, so I was kind of interested in the filmmaking process, but this, that was when the acting bug really kicked off. And um, then I just did a commercial and some guest roles and then, um, yeah, just, I started working professionally, I think, the the next year. So 15 is when I started. And I know you have a, a new film coming up here. I've started seeing the trailer for The Goldfinch. Yeah. So can you tell us about... You play Pippa. Right. So can you tell us about that role? Yeah, yeah she's... Pippa is... I mean, I feel so privileged to have been given that opportunity. I mean, she was a character that I held so close to my heart. She resonated a lot with me, but also Domitat's book and the material and and then the the adaptation and the people involved with it. They're just, it's art at um, a level that I've always wanted to, you know, take part in. Um, Pippa is this kind of, on the surface, this enigmatic, magical human being 
And then as soon as you kind of look a little deeper, you realize that there is a brokenness in her radiance and, and a robustness in her fragility. And she's this mixture of kind of beautiful melancholic contradictions. And she's a complex um, but just, yeah, gorgeous character. And I definitely had a personal connection to her in, in many ways, I think. Uh, similarly to Vic, they both do have this kind of immensity of of heart and feeling and emotion. And, um, yeah, she was – I don't know. I just – I feel so – it does feel like a surreal sort of um, – another world that I got to step into for a little while that didn't quite exist on this planet. And that's partly because of, you know, John Crowley is just a brilliant director and the writing, Peter Strawn and um, Roger Deakins and then all the beautiful actors in it. So It's a stacked cast. I love the way you talk about the characters you play. Do you love them? Like, are they, do they stay with yeah. you? Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, especially Pippa, you know, I think with lead roles, it's interesting because you kind of go on the, on the journey with them and there's, you sort of end up at a conclusion. But it was interesting with Pippa because, um, and I, I've been really fortunate to do a lot of um, leads in Australia and so on. And, and doing a supporting role was actually super fascinating because you don't get to have the full kind of the, the circle doesn't close as such. And, and I mean, the circle doesn't necessarily close on all characters, but you get to see it through. But this was like a little snapshot and I didn't get to kind of have, there was no finality about 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 it. And I went and did ADR uh, later on and felt, I, I just, I couldn't stop kind of crying afterwards because it just, she just stayed, you know, like it was just someone who, will probably always remain with me. I don't know. I just, I do, I guess, grow a lot from the characters and um, and especially that one. I had so much time with the book and the material. It was just, it moves you on a on a certain level, so. That's really moving. And I, I've only seen the trailer, but the entire story looks really moving and beautiful, so. Yeah, it was I'm sold. Special. I can't wait to see it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know we do have a couple of questions before yeah. we get out of here. Who has the first one? Hi, Ashley. Hello. So um, you obviously talk with such love and understanding about your characters. And so I was wondering, since they're both based on characters in, in books, yeah. how much, how did you put yourself into that? How did you make that role your own? And, and how much of on we see on screen was you or how much was the character on page? Great question. Um, yeah, oftentimes I, because, you know, I read the book, the books as a fan as well. So I kind of, I don't necessarily, like you always kind of identify with characters and what you can see of yourself within them, but they're always someone else. And so I often get the scripts and I'm like, but that's not me. Like I can't possibly, you know, take that on. Like I don't feel <laughs> worthy of that. Um, and you, I love the characters so much. I, I get a bit baffled when I'm cast <laughs> in the roles. Um, but Basically, I, I have been encouraged to bring a lot of myself to certain roles, um, which was kind of unnatural for me. I always wanted to be this kind of chameleonic actress, but um, I think there is great value in kind of turning up the dial on certain aspects of myself and, and offering that um, because there's one of me in the world and, and I can give something and serve that character in a certain way. Um, but it, it, is, it also is a process of transformation. You know, there's certain characteristics or mannerisms that I try and honor from the book. Um, I, I definitely keep the source material close. I don't, I try not to let it trap me in a sense that I don't have freedom, but I will, I will always try and reference it, you know, like whether it be a scene that's transplanted onto the script, I will take the thoughts that my character is having and literally write them on my script so I'm having the same internal dialogue that my character was that Joe Hill or Donna Tartt wrote. Um, but, yeah, it's it's also a process of letting go of certain things. Like with um, the goldfinch, we actually we let go of the physical manifestation of Pippa's, you know, limp and stuff because of, you know, a limited screen time that it didn't really serve the story. It was more about the emotional connection that we wanted to focus on. Um, with Vic, it was about, you know, as I was talking about, you know, starting with a more innocent version and not having the exact correlation. So you're never going to please all fans, but you're going to try and 
and offer something in service of the the story and the characters and what you're trying to portray and you just do your best. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, this is a question from our website, buildseries.com. So someone asked, the series shows a strong female character. How important do you think it is for actors and writers to have more complex roles for women? Great question. And that was something that I really fell in love with from the get-go. Um, and I spoke to Jamie O'Brien early on because once I read Joe's book, I was I saw that the you know this character was there in, in like all the dimensionalities you could hope for. She was flawed, but she was brilliant. And um, I think that complexity of character is is vital. Um, and Jamie really transplanted that onto onto the the TV ad adaptation. Uh, what we also talked about is expanding the term of the, the scope of the term strength to include those typically feminine qualities that I was talking about. We've seen this incredible uh, rise of female superheroes portrayed in you know Marvel um, movies and so on, and it's so empowering. But we did want to include these, you know, the creativity and the vulnerability and the empathy as part of her superpowers. You know, that's those are her strengths. So um, it was, I, I think it's so important that, that those qualities as well as female actors and stories are being represented. Um, so yeah, I feel very privileged to have been a part of that and being led by a female team. We had Jamie um, O'Brien, our showrunner and writer, one of the writers, there's a whole team of them, but um, she is the real life superhero. I always say it, she has this incredible strength and clarity but a kindness and collaboration and nurturing aspect. Kari Skoglin was directing. Um, she was the you know, set-up director. So it was extraordinary to be a part of that, that, that world. Thank you. I, I, you know, Vic is such a complex character, and I think what the coolest thing for me just seeing in the beginning is I can only imagine all the places she's going to go. The character yeah. has so much, so many different avenues. And I think that's what's going to be exciting for viewers yes. is that you're not quite sure what this world is or what's going to happen. And that's exciting. Yes. Well, we do have two more thirds of the novel yeah. um, and it gets pretty dark. So I, I really hope we get to do a, a few more seasons and get to explore um, the, the full journey that she kind of goes on and, um, yeah, stay tuned. Stay slash watch it so we can go again. <laughs> <laughs> stay tuned and watch it. No for our two premieres on AMC Sunday, June 2nd. Please put your hands together for Ashley coming. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming.